For more than a century, fishing boats have headed out to sea from the port of New Bedford on the south coast of Massachusetts, often traveling far offshore. Generation after generation, fishermen have worked to forge a living in what has always been one of the most demanding, dangerous, and rewarding professions. I used to tell people, the only thing you're guaranteed is a lot of hard work. You're not guaranteed sleep. You're not guaranteed food. You're not guaranteed comfort. Because I've gone days without eating. You know, just didn't have time to cook. We were just catching so much fish, we just kept fishing. There's an attitude, you know? And it probably goes on back generations before that. It probably goes back to whaling days. These guys were all individuals. They were all adventurous. And that carries right down into fishing. They're marine cowboys, you know? It's the Wild West, man. You're, you're out there, you're on your own, you know? In many ways, the fishing life is the same as it has always been. A lonely game of skill and luck that pulls fishermen far from their families and doesn't always pay off, even for the most talented practitioners. They have to be brave. They have to have integrity. They need to be determined. They have to have respect for the captain or nothing works. To be a good fisherman, you've got to have determination. You can't do this halfway. You gotta, you're all in or you're all out. It's dangerous, dangerous business. When we go offshore, it's 24 hours for eight or 10 days. You're peaceful, it's peaceful. It's hard work. It was a sense of freedom. You were free. The rich waters off the coast of New England have always attracted fishermen, from the Wampanoags to the early settlers. New Bedford grew into the world's largest whaling port in the mid-1800s, but as whaling faded, fishing took over. Fishing came in pretty much at the end of whaling's demise. Part of it was we had the infrastructure, which means we had all the wharves, we had shipyards, we had rope factories, people who knew how to fit out a boat, supply a boat, and repair a boat. Every good fisherman had to master a range of skills and many were constantly inventing new ways to do something better in every phase of the operation. I didn't realize that for each type of fishing, each one has a different net. And my father knew just how to make the net for that particular species of fish. You gotta know a lot of things. My father told me stories about when he first started going with his dad. He had to learn how to mend twine. He had to learn how to splice wire. He had to learn how to do everything at a high level. Because there's no way to turn. You can't just pull off the side of the road and say, hey, you know, we need a mechanic over here. They gotta be mechanics. They gotta be navigators. They gotta be, they gotta know where to go find a fish. When you're out on George's, it's almost like your backyard in a sense. <laughs> you kind of get used to it in a way that, all right, I caught a fish over here last year at such and such time of the, of the year, they might be there again. After a while, it became a pattern. There were friends and then there were competitors, and some of the friends were also competitors. They would share information, but it was not unusual for them to be on really good fishing and forget to answer their phone. You know, they, they all of a sudden, they had radio trouble. and you went chasing fish, and the more people you could beat catching fish, the better it was. When somebody called you and asked for a report of what you, what you were doing, yeah, oh, I'm getting two, three bushel here, you know. They might have 20 bushel on the deck, <laughs> you know, so. You 
always trying to do better than the next guy, you know? So you're always looking and you're always thinking, if this place goes dry, where's my next spot? Where am I gonna go next? And sometimes those that pan up. <laughs> no matter the stakes, in a time of need, everyone in the fleet pulls together. Hurricanes are fast and furious. You know, when one reaches you, you know, it blows like crazy for, for a couple of hours or so, and then it kind of dies away. Northeast is, is one day after one other. I've seen like three, four days of running. When you go out to sea, you are taking your life in your hand and you're taking a chance. Most of the time you get away with it, sometimes you don't. Over the years, hundreds of New Bedford fishermen have lost their lives at sea, many memorialized in the Seaman's Bethel, a block from the harbor. When I first started, we had wooden boats. We had no life rafts. We had no survival suits. What people used to say, if the boat's sinking, be the first guy to grab the anchor. End it right away, that's what it was. My guys used to always tell me, well, we're gonna have a good trip. I said, a good trip is you make it back to the dock, that's a good trip. No matter how bad it is, it's a good trip. It's a very, very dangerous job. I always say to people, don't say you went fishing and you're a fisherman in the month of June, July, and August. Go December, January, and February, and March. It's not February. Fishing has always had ups and downs, especially young men going out fishing with, with young families. It was difficult. It was always unstable. In the last part of the 20th century, an already difficult industry became even more challenging as new laws and regulations curtailed the fleet's movement and the traditional catch began shrinking. For years, everyone has maneuvered to reestablish a proper balance with scientists, regulators, fishermen, and environmentalists often disagreeing on the best way forward. I've been agreeing with you. A time ago, I was almost out of a job. I understand that, and I was against it being implemented. But year after year, a thriving scallop catch has kept the local industry rolling, keeping New Bedford on top as the nation's highest grossing fishing port. Today, over 500 fishing boats fish out of New Bedford. Dozens of support businesses work to repair and resupply them with everything needed to head back out for the next big catch. And all along the harbor, a workforce that still hails from all over the world works to offload the catch sell it at auction, process it, and ship it out to stores and restaurants everywhere. There are traditions in industry that once they start, they're hard to stop. That fishing is still thriving. We're right at the top, and we've been at the top for a couple decades and it gives us a sense of worth, really, as a community. Fishing does a lot for the mind, I think, and the soul. You'll see boats from anywhere from Virginia to Maine tied up in this harbor. They're fishing out in the wet. The long future, it's gonna take innovation to not exhaust the supply of fish and destroy the fishing grounds. That's going to take science, government, and the fishermen working together. I'm just hopeful that people will get the right solutions and keep the industry going. It's very important. It's very important that we keep it going. <laughs>